Trina is a management and communications consultant with Urban Systems. She has worked alongside professional engineers for most of her career. Trina holds a master's degree in professional communications and has over 20 years of business and communications experience. Please join me in welcoming Trina. Thank you so much. Start by saying, just rec acknowledging that we're on Coast Salish territory. And uh, if we started all of our meetings, business meetings, recognizing the traditional territory of the communities that we work with, that would go a long way towards relationship building. The topic that I've been asked to talk about is the role of an engineer in Aboriginal engagement and tips for engineers. And so I just wanted to acknowledge some of my colleagues that I have listed there. They're the engineers. I am not an engineer, so I'll do my best to represent what they had to say on this topic. And. Uh, Urban Systems uh, is a private, um, privately held engineering company with 400 staff and uh, 12 offices in Western Canada. And we've been working with municipal and provincial governments and Indigenous uh, First Nation governments since 1975. Um, and last year we won an award for Aboriginal Relations Best Practices. So uh, we do have some uh, good relationships and what we will be, what I'll be talking about is just some of the basic principles that have helped us to develop those relationships. I also wanted to just give you a bit of an overview of sort of how we touch First Nation communities or Indigenous communities. We have three main businesses. Uh, Urban Systems is a professional services company, so this is where we do our consulting work. It's uh, in engineering, environmental services, land use, land planning, and economic development and strategic services, like many of you if you're consulting engineers. Um, we also have a foundation, and Urban Systems, our, our partners donate a good uh, amount of their profits every year into the foundation, and the foundation's purpose is to help build capacity um, in communities and so we do that locally with First Nations and we also do some of it overseas um, and so we do uh, Aboriginal scholarships and we sponsor events and that type of thing through the foundation and most recently we've started Urban Matters which is a community contribution company and that's a hybrid between a for-profit and a non-profit uh, it's a new business model um, and the reason that we did that is that we found that um, because we are working in such a complex environment, um, our for-profit professional service model makes it difficult sometimes to really focus on research and innovation. Peter was talking about the need for creativity, for long-term strategies. When you're uh, doing a project and you're trying to get in and out as fast as you can. We've all, we all have utilization targets. We're there to earn money. Um, it can sometimes limit our ability to be innovative and creative. And so we've started this social enterprise to try and help do that. It's early days. Uh, we're learning as we go, but that's how we sort of touch uh, First Nation communities in these different realms. There was three areas that my colleagues said when we talk about engineering roles. Um, so one would be working with communities on behalf of industry and project proponents like Peter was talking about, uh, working with uh, communities on behalf of governments, and then perhaps working directly with and for Indigenous communities or Aboriginal communities. And Urban Systems is mainly in the third area there. We don't do a lot of mega project engineering, which many of you probably do. And so our perspective is maybe not at a scale and complexity, of what we've talked about earlier today and we have to acknowledge that that these are tough issues and so some of the suggestions and tips that I'm giving they've worked but in certain circumstances and skills it may be harder to to implement. There's technical and design expertise, advocating for and following clear consultation and engagement processes. So these when we're working as engineers in communities um, we want to make sure that we understand what the community's consultation and engagement processes are. Many of them have them, some do not. If they don't have them, they should have them, and there's an opportunity to work with communities to talk about that and talk about how they could maybe get some funding in place to develop their own consultation and engagement policies. And I know Caroline does quite a bit of that work. Um, so 
Consulting engineers have a role to play as a liaison between communities and proponents and governments. I think we're often on the ground, front lines in the communities building relationships. And I think that this presentation and what I'm going to talk about is really more about building relationships and helping to build capacity in communities. The one thing that I would say all uh, engineers that are working with First Nation communities have in common is that we need to navigate a very complex environment. So First Nation communities, sometimes we will go in there and we have a specific project in mind or an objective that we're trying to achieve. Um, and communities, these are governments that are handling a whole lot of issues that would typically be handled by federal and provincial and local governments. Um, and so understanding what's going on for the communities in terms of these different areas. Maybe they've just had an election. Maybe it's hunting season. Maybe there's been a death in the community. So understanding what's going on in the communities can really help people to um, navigate and um, go at the appropriate times to communities. And um, so just understanding these different factors that may have uh, an impact on whatever it is that you're trying to achieve because likely your objective is not necessarily their top objective at the moment. The first tip that we have is just diversity. We, when we're working with First Nation communities, just like any community, we have to understand that there's a lot of diversity of traditions and culture and customs, and we can't assume that because we've worked in one place that, that those same perceptions or traditions or protocols are gonna be uh, appropriate in the next place. The other thing is to really operate from a position of respect. Um, and again, I work with First Nation communities on a regular basis. And so when I talk about this, this is because this is what they've said to me. I sit at their side of the table often, and they're saying, you know, uh, we companies will bring in people and they're bringing their junior intern to speak to our chief and council and so they don't feel always that decision makers are meeting with decision makers and that can be problematic for them. So again, this is just something to think about when you're going in, obviously depending on the type of negotiations or the scope of what you're working on, this will be important about who you're sending to represent. It sounds like Peter uh, goes and meets with chiefs and I think that that's really good for relationship building. This quote here I thought was interesting. And basically uh, it's suggesting that, you know, First Nations, they have their own governance and decision making protocols like any community. And a lot of communities, uh, their hereditary leaders and their elders are very influential, probably all of the communities. And so sometimes uh, consulting engineers or proponents are dealing with the elected council, which of course you need to, but to really uh, influence decision making in communities, you need to know, you know who's in the background and what are they thinking and how are you going to engage with them in a meaningful way because ultimately they're the ones that are going to um, you know influence the community time is money we often are trying to get in and out and be as efficient as we can um, but we need to be in communities to build relationships you cannot sit in offices in Vancouver and, and um, expect that people are going to know who you are, care about your call, return your phone call, those types of things. You have to spend time in communities and um, I know that's not, you, you guys know that, um, but who's there as well, right? Are the decision makers there? Are people um, trusting you? Because it, it takes a lot of time and repeated visits for people to feel comfortable talking with you. Um, this looks a lot like uh, Peter's scientific <laughs> spreadsheet, <laughs> not at all. I mean, the community members that I talk to, they talk about uh, indigenous worldviews, and that is not scientific necessarily in nature. They talk about, you know, starting from a human being perspective at the center. This graphic is from the First Nations Health Authority, and everything is connected. And it starts with people, 
and healthy people and then community and it moves out to the outer circle but a lot of the project work we always come from the outside in that's how we approach things and so to understand communities um, start to think about uh, the people there the, and everything's connected to spirit land uh, it's not always scientific and it's not always money based and this is what the folks tell me all the time the other thing here is that come with the learner's perspective you know we all have degrees some people have multiple degrees but there's a lot of people in communities that have a lot of knowledge to share. It may be lived experience knowledge, it may not be coming from a textbook, but they've been on the land and they understand it and to show up there and to um, appreciate that is, is well received. So communication. Transparency is very important. Um, Word gets around if you're not communicating in respectful ways or if you're doing things to uh, jerk around communities, the other communities will find out about it and they talk to each other and uh, your reputation is very important. Um, Face-to-face -face communication, like I was saying, be present in the communities as much as possible. Um, written communications are necessary, obviously, but the more visuals, the more storytelling, the more oral communications, that's where people are going to start to respond to you at community meetings and those types of things. Practical designs and plans. Sometimes we get really caught up in the technical, the latest and greatest, designs, but forget that the people that are um, going to have to live with these designs maybe don't have staff to maintain certain things or they don't have access to resources. So that selling people things that they don't need or designs that are overcomplicated or plans that are just going to sit on shelves, that ends up really uh, not adding a lot of value to communities. It costs a lot more money and like we heard about with Peter, sometimes there's a lot of um, work being done that maybe could be streamlined or done in a way that could add more value. Uh, reconciliation is a very big topic. Uh, other people have talked about this. I think it's really important for all people working in communities to understand some of the history um, around what has happened. The Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission, the reports out, there's a lot of recommendations and calls to action for various sectors about how private sector can and governments can start to respect and honor some of the history that is there because this really does affect how communities are engaging in projects because you know if they've had generational impacts of a lot of you know residential schools um, they may not be as able to come and participate in projects or the economy as as they could be if some of this uh, healing had started to take place, which I think it's really, there's a lot of positive momentum here, but we have a lot of learning to do about the history, I think, and if you're working in First Nation communities, I urge you to, uh, to read those uh, recommendations. Another thing is to really think about building trust. Investing in communities will help to build trust. Um, there is a need for capacity development in communities, um, leadership development, employment, um, cultural programs. When companies are coming and they're investing in communities over the long term, then those communities, that's a much easier starting point for a negotiation when you've been there and people know that this program you funded over time has really made a difference for them in their community, that's really going to help you to negotiate. Um, don't show up just when it's time to have the project and think that you're immediately going to get trust or that you're going to do one thing and it's going to come right away. It takes a long time and a lot of investment. 
And so I just wanted to put in a bit of a plug for shared value, which is basically the idea that there was earlier talked about corporate social responsibility. Um, shared value is, I guess, an evolution of that in thinking that companies that embed social purpose into their core business operations will actually financially outperform their competitors. This is, um, comes out of Harvard Business School, Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, and they've actually engaged with some energy companies um, around what that could look like in the uh, extractives business. And here's some of the recommendations that they have uh, come up with there. So just go on their website and have a look at that. It's pretty interesting stuff. And if you haven't really started to do some, uh, you know, uh, education or uh, in your corp in your companies, um, I encourage you to visit uh, Bob Joseph's website if you want to read. He has a weekly blog. It's great. He has a lot of really good information around community engagement and Aboriginal relations. Um, I do a lot of work up in Treaty 8 territory, and uh, this other photo is a, a cross-sectors culture camp that we held. We spent two days camp with a bunch of industry folks and private business people, and uh, the First Nations talked about their views and what um, their traditional governance looks like. And that I learned a lot through those two days. And actually, and I think the First Nation people learned a lot about the community, uh, the company people as well. So there's a lot of different ways to invest in communities and getting to know and building relationships. But um, the time is not, like I said, when the project's ready to roll. So um, because I work in capacity building, um, there's programs that industry and companies fund. Um, and you know, I've heard recently because of the downturn in the markets that you know, this isn't the time to be investing and it's hard to do that because money is tight. And I, I totally appreciate that and that's legitimate. Um, but I think that relationships are not necessarily just transactional. They have to be, you have to be able to count on people over the long run, right? And so figure out what you can invest and invest on a sustained basis if you can. Um, because really, companies and proponents, they can't afford not to be investing in relationships right now. We've heard about the challenges. And if you think about what is the cost of not getting that consent or that buy-in from the communities, that's a big dollar amount. It's our whole Canadian economy, right? And so um, it has to be done. So uh, there's a whole bunch of resources here if you, you're going to be have this presentation available. These resources, are, I mean, ACEC has the list of resources around engagement um, process. What these resources are are more around um, I guess, Aboriginal cultural awareness and ways to learn about the history and the culture of First Nations people as a bit of a foundation to that other um, relationship building piece. So that's it. Those are our tips.